Yeah. Sorry for the lack of space, but uh, this ought to tell you what kind of speaker we have in store for you today. Um, with that, let me make um, the quick introduction so that we uh, reserve as much time for Professor Miller as possible. So thank you for joining us uh, for our uh, what's becoming increasingly frequent uh, DOD history program speaker series. We're delighted to welcome you, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Miller, to the Pentagon. Professor Miller is an assistant professor of history at Dartmouth College, uh, where she teaches courses on uh, the Cold War, World War II in the Pacific, and the history of U.S. foreign relations generally. Um, she received her Ph.D. from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her book, which is the topic of discussion today, is Cold War Democracy, United States and Japan. It was published earlier this month by Harvard University Press. As one preeminent scholar of the Cold War, has written in a review, quote, this is a book that inspires deep thinking about what democracy promotion has meant and should mean. Dr. Miller's study examines, quote, the ideological core of the Japanese-American relationship with profound insights for one of the most important and lasting partnerships of the post-1945 era. Uh, Professor Miller will be addressing some of these insights in today's talk um, titled Rearming Japan, Cold War Visions of Democracy and Military Power. And after um, her remarks, we'll open the floor to questions until the top of the hour. So please join me in welcoming Professor Miller to the sort of stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. OK, can everyone hear me OK? So I want to thank you all for coming, especially on this beautiful day. I live in New Hampshire, where it is not so beautiful yet. So I'm amazed that people would choose to come be inside. So I'll try to make it worth your while. Now, historians and commentators have long debated the place of democracy in American foreign policy. Are US actions across the globe motivated by democratic ideals and intentions? Or are American claims about the importance of democracy simply an empty rhetorical facade, a mask to disguise the United States' true motivations of access to markets or resources or war making or imperial domination? Now, within this discussion, one of the most frequently cited case studies is the relationship between the United States and Japan. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States occupied and radically transformed Japan under the stated goal of democratization. The occupation authorities wrote a new constitution. They held elections. They reformed the Japanese educational system. They empowered labor unions, among a bevy of other reforms. Politicians and policymakers have thus cited Japan as a prominent example of the United States' democratic intentions and capabilities. Prior to the invasion of Iraq, and this is probably the most famous invocation of Japan, President George W. Bush, both publicly and privately, pointed to Japan as an example of the United States' ability to democratize foreign states and peoples. Yet others have pushed back very forcefully on this claim. In particular, Scholars who want to counter this idea have pointed to the later years of the U.S. occupation, when, they've argued, U.S. foreign policy became obsessed with anti-communism. In parallel to developments within the United States, the occupation authorities began to prevent labor strikes. They purged labor activists and alleged communists. They censored newspapers. They wrote new laws designed to counter subversion. The occupation authorities met with and cooperated with former members of the Japanese wartime government and rebuilt Japanese military forces with the goal of building a firm security alliance between the United States and Japan. <coughs> so this leaves us with a question. How should we understand the place of democracy in this story? Now what I want to do in my talk today is take a slightly different approach to this debate. I want to argue that Americans did care about democracy in post-war Japan even after the start of the Cold War, but not in the ways that many people think. And indeed, I think that both sides of this discussion often miss a critical point, which is that the meaning of democracy has changed over time. And it was in the process of being redefined by the earth-shattering events of the 1930s and 1940s, the Great Depression, World War II, and the start of the Cold War. It's a lot for about a 15-year span. 
Now, in my book, I argue that the experiences of World War II and the rise of the Cold War sparked the emergence of a specific definition of democracy. And this is the belief that democracy was not merely structural, but that democracy was also a mental and psychological system. So politicians, scholars, members of the US occupation authorities, members, uh, military leaders, claimed that democracy was not just based on the presence of political rights. It was not just based on specific practices like voting. It was not based just on the presence of representative institutions like a Congress or a parliament. Rather, they argued that for democracy to take root and for democracy to endure, it required what one policymaker called, quote, a state of mind or what people often refer to as the democratic spirit. Democracy in this telling required rationality, it required self-confidence, it required public resolve. A real democracy, these advocates would claim, was one in which the people were mentally and spiritually and psychologically strong. Even if this strength sometimes came at the expense or required the limiting of other rights and freedoms. Now, as I argue in my book, which is entitled Cold War Democracy, the United States and Japan, here you can see the cover, it's just come out with Harvard. This conception of democracy was crucial to the US occupation of Japan and the alliance that followed. Now, in particular, and this is what I'm gonna talk about today, it was a vital context to one of the more controversial American decisions during the occupation, which was the decision to end Japan's demilitarization and rebuild Japanese military power. So what I'm gonna do today in this talk is there'll be two parts. First, I wanna explain the origins and key features of this understanding of democracy, and then I wanna give a quick case study about Japanese rearmament to show how this way of thinking shaped actual policy. And in my view, this story allows us to develop sort of a deeper understanding of the impact and consequences on democratic ideologies in shaping US engagement with the wider world. So I'm gonna start with this first part by explaining sort of some of this thinking, where did it come from and what were some of its contours? So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the American occupation of Japan and American thinking about democracy during and immediately after World War II. Now, when World War II formally ended in September of 1945 and the US began the occupation of Japan, American leaders had assigned themselves a very lofty goal. They claimed they were gonna fundamentally transform and democratize Japan. And the key element of their thinking here was that if Japan was democratic, they thought, it would no longer seek to wage aggressive war. They could build a democratic Japan that was engaged in the international system. That would remove the desires that had led Japan to wage World War II in the first place. From the beginning, however, the occupation authorities believed that democratizing Japan was not just about new structures or political practices, though these were, of course, vital. It was also about building new mentalities, a new consciousness. For example, as Secretary of State James Burns declared upon Japan's surrender in September of 1945, its official surrender, the official end of the war, quote, we have come to the second phase of our war against Japan, what might be called the spiritual disarmament of the people of that nation, to make them want peace instead of wanting war. Now, in part, this idea emerged from how Americans understood the causes of the Pacific War. During the war, many Americans argued that Japanese militarism had drawn its unique power from the mental weaknesses of the Japanese people. This was a very racialized way of thinking. They claimed that the Japanese people were overly emotional and irrational, that they had an infantile or childlike psychology. The most infamous version of this thinking traced Japanese militarism to overly aggressive toilet training. That's the most extreme example. And um, American leaders argued that Japanese leaders had sort of preyed on this infantile psychology, that they had deceived the Japanese people with promises of false glory, 
to control and manipulate the Japanese mind. And this had been key to Japan's ability, to Japanese aggression and its ability to wage this long sustained war. In this line of thinking then, only new Japanese mentalities and psychologies could destroy the roots of Japanese aggression. And so American occupation policy sought to foster these sort of rational, self-aware democratic subjects that would internalize rights like freedom of speech or freedom of thought, that would act upon those rights, and that was capable of distinguishing between democratic and anti-democratic ideas. The policies of the early occupation then, such as elections or education reform or political purges, thus aim to remove Japanese militarism from the public sphere while simultaneously sort of liberating the Japanese mind and fostering a democratic consciousness. So they believed elections, for example, was a way that one developed and like sort of unleashed their democratic consciousness. And this would supplant the militarism that Americans believed was responsible for the war. However, by the late 1940s, American policymakers increasingly feared that destroying militarism, removing militarism, was not enough to secure a healthy and rational democratic regime in Japan. They became more and more anxious that communism was now a global threat to this so-called democratic mind. That communists, like the wartime militarist regime, would poison the public mind through propaganda. And indeed, the American panic about communism in Japan and elsewhere was not simply due to the military power of the Soviet Union or to geostrategic or global economic calculations, though these were certainly crucial. This anxiety also stemmed from the fear or the belief that communism was a psychological threat, that it sought to destroy the rational and healthy mentalities that were necessary to democracy that communist subversion would be effective, that communists would come to power if the people were weak and feeble-minded. A bevy of speeches and government memos proclaim that a commitment to communism was not simply a political or economic stance. It wasn't simply a choice to pursue a different political philosophy or a different form of economic organization. A commitment to communism was instead an act of psychological perversion. As the 1950 National Security Council document known as NSC 68, one of the most seminal documents of the early Cold War, as NSC 68 declared, communism or a commitment to communism necessitated, quote, an act of willing submission, a degradation willed by the individual upon himself under the compulsion of a perverted faith. Communism therefore required a complete assure of the individualism necessary to democracy, a submission that came out of someone's mental weaknesses, their vulnerability to this perverted faith. Now, people feared in the early Cold War that democratic societies were especially vulnerable to communist subversion, precisely because these dangerous ideas, this so-called perverted faith, could be disseminated through free speech or a free press or open elections, that people would essentially choose their own enslavement out of psychological weakness. And this, of course, thus led to things like a desire to constrain speech. And so here we have, for example, in the late occupation, right after the Korean War, the Japanese police, under the orders of the occupation authorities, are shutting down the newspaper of the Japanese Communist Party in Japan. In this line of thinking then, for democracy to survive, elections or constitutions were not enough. For democratic rights and practices to endure, democracy required a psychologically strong citizenry that was vigilant about protecting democratic values and distinguishing between healthy and harmful ideas. Now, though NSC 68 was written about the United States, the occupation authorities actually held similar ideas in Japan. And to give you an example, in May 1950, General Douglas MacArthur, who I'm sure everyone recognizes with his very large pipe, General Douglas MacArthur, who was the head of the US occupation authorities, gave a speech that was designed to celebrate the third anniversary of Japan's constitution, which had been written by the occupation authorities. But he mostly used this speech to issue a warning that Japan was under threat. 
And what's interesting here is that in this speech, which is a few months after NSC 68, a document MacArthur has not read, very likely has not read, he expresses some of the exact same ideas that are present in that document, even though he's been in Japan, holed up in, the, um, in his occupation headquarters the entire time. And so in this speech, MacArthur warned that Japan was under siege by, quote, a small minority which through the pervasive use of liberty and privilege seeks to encompass freedom's destruction. So it's under siege by communists that were using the new rights conferred by the occupation to destroy democracy, essentially. Japanese communists, he declared, had embarked on, quote, the spread of false, malicious, and inflammatory propaganda designed to uh, mislead and coerce the public mind. MacArthur therefore declared that the survival of democracy required constant vigilance and mental strength against this communist threat. Now, this conception of democracy led to ironic and unexpected outcomes. In both the United States and Japan, proponents of this worldview claimed that the only way to achieve this mental strength was not only through pro-democratic education, but through harsh and rigid practices such as loyalty oaths, censorship, political purges, and anti-subversive laws that would forcefully suppress communist ideas and activities. This sort of dialectic process, whereby an obsession with fostering democratic qualities, an obsession with securing an ill-defined and sort of nebulous democratic mind and spirit fueled an almost anti-democratic democracy. That dialectic process, this fear that democracy was both a strength yet extremely vulnerable at the same time, that stands at the core of what my book is calling Cold War Democracy. Now, all of this might sound a little abstract. So for the remainder of the talk, I want to give an example of how this conceptual of de conceptualization of democracy actually shaped US policy. And the example I want to talk about was one of the most controversial moments of the US occupation, which was the decision to begin rearming Japan. Now, when World War II ended, one of the key goals of the US occupation was the total eradication of Japanese militarism. Throughout the war, American policymakers had repeatedly blamed Japan's military leaders and Japanese militarism for causing World War II in the Pacific. Uh, most famously, the Potsdam Declaration, which is the document that was issued in the summer of 1945, articulating surrender terms for Japan, declared that the militarists had deceived and misled the Japanese people, and that that was what had caused war. Therefore, during the first two years of the occupation, the occupation authorities completely demobilized Japan's military. They ordered the Japanese government, because the occupation ran through Japan's existing government, to undertake a large-scale purge that would remove militarists, military leaders, military officers from public life. Mil any national symbol that was believed to be militaristic or nationalistic, even something like an image of Mount Fuji, these kinds of symbols were censored or banned. An international tribunal tried key military leaders and sentenced some of them to death. The new constitution drafted by the occupation authorities formally banned offensive military forces. And Article 9 of this constitution declared that, quote, air, land, and sea forces will never be maintained. So the first two years of the occupation, the premise is that a democratic Japan requires the total issue of military power. However, in 1950, the occupation authority seemingly did a U-turn. With the beginning of the Korean War, many believe that communism was on the verge of taking over Asia. And so MacArthur ordered the creation of a new defense force called the National Police Reserve, or NPR. And the NPR would go through several iterations to ultimately become the self-defense force, the SDF, Japan's military today. Now, many people at the time, especially but not exclusively on the Japanese left, claimed that this decision meant the United States had completely dropped its commitment to a democratic Japan. They criticized the United States as blinded by its fear of communism and said that the US was operating out of hysteria. It sought to empower the very militarist forces that had led Japan into dictatorship and a disastrous war. But while the NPR was a clear change in policy, I argue in my book that this decision was not really a clear cut departure from earlier thinking about democracy. Rather, 
it was a product, it was shaped by the way that many American policymakers and the occupation authorities had understood democracy as the product of mental strength, vigilance, and so-called spirit as much as actual institutions or practices. Indeed, the occupation authorities did not just hope that the NPR would enhance Japan's defensive capabilities, though that was, of course, key. They also believed or hoped that the NPR would produce the responsible, committed, mentally strong citizens and leaders that are necessary, that they believe necessary to building an ideologically and psychologically secure democracy. They proclaimed that military training combined with sort of a broader public awareness of Japan's ability to defend itself would foster the confidence and the resilience and the morale necessary to resisting communism and the communist assault on the minds and souls of the people. So in here, for example, you can see an NPR recruitment poster that proclaims that idea. He's standing in front of the Japanese diet building, a symbol of representative politics, looking very resolved. And the slogan is sort of like, you yourself will participate in securing peace and order in a democratic Japan. To give an example of these ideas, for example, in September of 1950, the State Department asserted that the shocking start of the Korean War had raised questions about the, quote, psychological attitudes of the Japanese people. Unless the Japanese people have some sense of continued security, the State Department warned, it will be natural to expect a growth of a sense of futility of resistance to communism. And in this way of thinking, the NPR was not just about building up Japan's actual ability to defend itself against foreign aggression or internal security. It was also designed to provide this sense of security, to make the Japanese people feel secure. And I was struck in that quote from the State Department how much they emphasize that. They need a sense of continued security. Now, these ideas shaped US and Japanese efforts to train and recruit soldiers and officers for the NPR. For example, US officers who participated in NPR training, and by 51 or 52, all the NPR camps had US trainers and officers that were stationed in the camp as um, part of this effort. These officers and speeches that they gave to members of the NPR emphasized that the NPR would secure Japanese democracy by enhancing its physical strength against communism, but also Japan's psychological strength against communism. For example, as a senior US military advisor declared in a September 1950 speech to NPR recruits, the NPR would, quote, ensure that the rights guaranteed to each and every Japanese citizen under Japan's new constitution remain inviolate, and, quote, renew the confidence in your nation's security and ability to defend itself against internal sabotage, revolution, and lawless depredation. And yes, this is a fascinating article about the NPR that was in the Saturday Evening Post in 1952. Um, it's was one of the few images I could find that actually has members of the NPR with American military officers outside of the National Archives. And I didn't have time to go back to the National Archives for my images. Yet both American military trainers and the NPR Japanese staff, the NPR's Japanese leaders, soon came to fear that the NPR might not be able to fulfill this lofty role of renewing confidence in Japanese democracy and its ability to stand strong against communism. And in particular, they worried constantly about what they called the quality of NPR personnel. Um, speaking in the early 50s, Hayashi Keizo, the NPR's commander, lamented the NPR's lack of military spirit. Uh, a former Imperial Army general that was still close with Japanese Prime Minister Yoshida Shiguru described the early NPR as a, quote, undisciplined mob. Uh, if you read oral histories by early members of the NPR, they talk about how Yakuza, Japanese gangsters, were members of the NPR. Not exactly the people you want renewing your faith in the democratic spirit. Now, such inferior personnel in the minds of US policymakers and Japanese policymakers were a problem not only because the NPR might, have, might not have tactical skills, right? Might not be able to actually defend Japan if there was some sort of invasion or revolution. 
But so-called inferior personnel, people feared, would also leave the NPR and Japan more broadly open to communist infiltration. And Americans were very open about this fear. One American advisor bemoaned that the low recruitment standards of the NPR meant, quote, we will only get the jobless and probably uneducated type of no professional standards who are wide open to subversive influences. Another advisor claimed that it was essential that commanders and staffs from the lowest to the highest have the moral and patriotic stamina to resist communism and become a real force for law and order. These fears led both American and Japanese to seek new solutions in the NPR, particularly by improving the NPR's leadership, its officers. These early efforts to populate the NPR had been limited by the fact that anyone who had serious military experience in Japan had been purged and could not join the NPR. So where do you get new officers for the NPR? The purges of the early occupation had been incredibly far-reaching. Anybody above the rank of captain, anyone who had graduated from Japan's military academies were banned from participating in public life. And this meant they could not join the NPR. But with these fears about the nature of the quality of the NPR, during 1951, the US occupation authorities began to discuss potentially changing the purge terms, depurging, they called it, to allow these experienced military personnel to join the NPR. American supervisors of the NPR began to claim that only these former soldiers who had the discipline and commitment of the wartime Japanese army could, surpri could supply the needed leadership and spiritual strength to the NPR. This was perhaps most clear in the memoir of the main American military advisor, a man named Frank Kowalski, who recalled that purged officers, quote, possess much they could give to the new force, military confidence, strength of character, and devotion to country. More than any soldier, the Japanese Imperial Army soldier had military spirit. Spirit, heart, guts, whatever one calls it, is the essence of a fighting force. This was a dramatic reversal. Only five years before, these officers had been described by the Americans as the psychological causes of Japanese militarism who had deceived and misled the Japanese people into a disastrous war. Now they were being identified as a source of spirit and devotion, not just military competence, right, Kowalski says, but strength of character, devotion to country, heart, guts, the devotion, the resolve so necessary to strengthening the NPR into something that could inspire the resistance necessary in a democratic society. By 1951, such beliefs were even shared by General Matthew Ridgway who had replaced MacArthur as the head of the occupation authorities after <coughs> MacArthur was removed by President Truman. So Ridgway has taken over, he's taken over the Korean War and he's also taken over the occupation of Japan, which is a little bit secondary on his agenda to you know, fighting the Korean War. And they led Ridgway to make a big shift in occupation policy. Specifically, Ridgway intervened to change the terms of the purge so that Imperial Army veterans would be able to join the NPR as officers. Writing in June of 1951, Ridgway argued that men who had graduated from Japan's military academies after 1937, and 1937 was when Japan's invasion of China went from just Manchuria into all of China. So after 1937, that these men should be allowed to join the NPR, these military academy graduates. And Ridgway's reasoning was especially interesting he claimed these experienced officers should be eligible because they had only provided, quote, the service which a man owes his country in a time of war. They were, he said, quote, motivated by normal patriotism. Such claims amounted to a major rewriting of the narratives that US policymakers had developed about Japan's recent history. Rather than blaming the military and militarism as the cause of disastrous war, Ridgway recast the nature of Japanese wartime military service. It was not the product of totalitarian mobilization or a state that dominated and manipulated the minds of the people. Instead, it stemmed from civic responsibility, the service a man owes his country, patriotism and national devotion, a healthy and normal psychology not one manipulated by the state, a normal psychology, the exact qualities that were desired in the NPR. 
Ridgeway ultimately did change the purge terms, which opened access to a larger pool of manpower, and several groups of these depurged officers <coughs> would enter the NPR in 1951 <coughs> and 1952. And so with Ridgeway's decision and the language in which he expressed this decision, we can see how an emphasis on the NPR is a source not only of new capabilities, but also psychological, even spiritual mobilization, both within the NPR, but for Japan more broadly, led to unexpected and surprising outcomes. <coughs> it fostered a growing convergence between US military officials and former members of the Japanese military. And these were really some of the ideas that enabled the formation of this new military force, which is one that of course still exists today and continues to have close relationships with the American military. So to conclude, since my 30 minutes are up, what can we learn from this story? <coughs> First and more broadly, it shows that democracy itself has a history. This is a very basic point, but I think it's one that's incredibly important. Democracy does not mean the same thing in every time and place. The values that people ascribe to a successful democracy are a product of their context, and they often change with that context. And that means that if we want to understand the impact of democratic visions and ideologies on the conduct of policy, we shouldn't limit our discussion to simply celebrating those who we believe promoted democracy or condemning those who we believe didn't promote democracy. Instead, we should pay close attention to what they thought democracy meant, the goals, the limitations, the hopes, the fears they invested under this big term, and then think very critically about these ideas. What sorts of outcomes did they enable and what sorts of outcomes or policies did they prevent? That's my first point. Second, and more specifically to the time period that I discussed, I think this story allows us to grasp, to better grasp how people understood politics during the early Cold War. It shows how central these sort of psych psychological and spirit-based ideas were to how, leader, how American leaders understood democracy. And it can also help us see the rigidities and limitations of this thinking. It was quite preoccupied with subversion and infiltration. It was not particularly interested in what the Japanese public wanted. The occupation claimed to be liberating the Japanese people, yet also doing this under an American military occupation. It led to an obsession with vague and immeasurable qualities, mind, spirit, sometimes over and even against the expansion of concrete rights. And indeed, this way of thinking led US policymakers to empower a hierarchical and to many Japanese very dangerous institution, the military, in order to protect democracy. And if there's a lesson in this story to us today, it's exactly that, that the promise to promote democracy abroad, even if it's sincere, can have strange and unintended consequences. I will stop there. So I'm happy to take questions. All the way in the back. Well, I have a question. You, you did mention the role of the Imperial House and how you know, the, the Japanese military up to the end of World War II uh, had, a, had a very different commander in chief. Mm -hmm. How does that conception change and fit with democracy? So uh, that's an excellent question. So prior to 1945, the Japanese military did not res was not did not or did not report in any way, that's not the right language, to Japan's prime minister or to the diet or anything. It was directly responsible to the emperor. And uh, the military really used this idea in the 30s and 40s as, it, as military officers started carrying out extra legal assassinations and things like that within Japan, really laid claim to this mantle of being responsive to the emperor and defending the emperor. And it was a core element of military ideology. After the war, right, the emperor is sustained, the emperor's system is sustained, the emperor is stripped of his divinity and now is a symbol of unity of the Japanese people. In the military, they thought a lot about this question. And there's a lot of discussions where US military advisors would emphasize how the chain of command needs to work, that this military needs to be responsive uh, to the, under, the command, under the control of the prime minister, that you should have a system like the United States with sort of like a secretary of defense sort of system or something like that. Civilian control is a big point of discussion 
And civilian control will come to sort of mean some different things in Japan than it does in the United States. In particular, it sort of as the SDF grows, it comes to mean civilian control of some of the bureaucratic elements of the SDF. But that is something I talk about this in the chapter. It's something that gets a lot of discussion. On the other hand, it's one of the ways that a lot of people criticize the NPR. So in 1951 and 52, as people are saying like, oh man, this NPR, like these people are undisciplined. They don't know what they're fighting for. Behind the scenes, former Imperial Army generals, um, people who had served in the Imperial Army are sort of sending memos to the occupation authorities saying that the NPR doesn't really understand what it's fighting for. You know, the Imperial Japanese Army knew what it was about. It knew what it was defending. It was going to fall like a cherry blossom for the emperor. And the NPR doesn't have that same level of morale and commitment. So that became another argument to bring back people from the Imperial Army because they thought the NPR compared so unfavorably to the, the kind of core and spirit of the Imperial Army. Now, of course, these former generals and things like that who are writing these memos have their own motives as well. They're hoping that the NPR is going to help be kind of a path into public, back into public life for them because they've been purged and they're not allowed to participate in public discussions. And it actually did sort of function in that way. Other questions? Yeah. Do you speak much to the difference in the US view of spreading democracy and implementing it here versus our view uh, with our rallying cry of spreading democracy in the 90s or today, say Iraq or Afghanistan? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not an expert, you know, I'm not an expert on Iraq or Afghanistan. I think one of the biggest differences between 1945 and the 90s and 2000s is the scope of the conflict prior to the occupation of Japan. When I say that you know, US policymakers cared about democracy in Japan, it's because the question of a peaceful democratic Japan versus a non-peaceful, non-democratic Japan is not theoretical to them. Right? They have just spent four years fighting this massive war. They knew what Japan was capable of. And so I think it's a different level of commitment precisely because of the experiences of World War II. And because that was such a global conflagration, a global conflict, and because Japan and Germany had technically been democratic in some ways before the war. We don't think of them in that way, but they had parliaments. Japan had a diet. Japan had elections. All men over the age of 25 could vote. And that did not stop militarism from coming to the fore. It didn't stop World War II. So when they think about democracy, they're very much thinking back to the experiences of World War II, the scope of that war, but also the experiences of the 1930s when these countries like Japan and G Germany that were structurally democratic imploded anyway. And I think that creates a different kind of commitment to democracy than what you see in the 90s and 2000s when you have not had a conflict of that scope, right? If anything, you know, you have the end of the Cold War, so there is some sort of ideas of victory, but there's not the direct experience of a war in the same way, if that makes sense. Uh, the idealism, though, expressed you know, by the occupation authorities through the Constitution, though, by the Eisenhower period and JFK and LBJ, though, the application of Cold War policy, security-wise, by the United States across the world changed or did not necessarily fit that idealistic model that we tried to do with Germany and Japan, for example, in Iran, pre homemade mm -hmm. Iran, uh, and you know, Central America mm -hmm. and so forth, where democracy was not did, had not existed, was not an issue or a goal for us to deal with our allies. In other words, he's our dictator and that mm -hmm. type of thing. So, how did this shift from idealism? Now, and you probably you've covered it. You know, it's a pragmatic shift. But was it ever seriously thought about or put down on paper that we have to shuck, you know, chuck away this idealism of turning the world to democracy and basically go into a more pragmatic approach of security against yeah. the communist bloc? I mean, there were certainly documents. You know, one of the ways you see this actually on paper is in 1947, 1948, writing about the occupation and saying that, OK, we've had these couple years where we empowered labor unions, we legalized the Communist Party. And now we're having a lot of strikes and all these demonstrations and communist subversion is threatening Japan and we need to turn in another direction. So you do see that concretely down on paper.
in places vis-a-vis -vis Japan. You said it happened to you in the 20s and 30s, you know, yeah. these violent strikes. And uh, yeah. But I also think that one thing we have to think about, and this goes back to my answer to the previous question, is that Japan is in quite a unique position vis-a-vis -vis many other countries the United States will build alliances or military relations relationships with during the Cold War. It's in a unique position in part because of the experiences of World War II, which creates an investment in democracy in Japan that you don't necessarily have in other places. It's also in a unique position because U.S. policymakers by the early 50s are sort of seizing on Japan as a way to make the case that the U.S. does actually care about democracy, even as it's doing these other things, like empowering military dictators elsewhere or funding the French in Indochina as they're trying to suppress right, the anti-colonial war that's going on there. right? The U.S. knows that it is vulnerable to the criticism or the charge of communist propaganda, or that what communist propaganda commonly says, that it is it lies, it doesn't really care about democracy, it's just an empire, it only cares about power. And so U.S. policymakers, and for example, in the treaty, I write about this in the chapter that's on the treaty that ended the occupation, very consciously want to be like, no, 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 look at Japan. Look what we did in Japan. This shows you, Japan shows you that we mean what we say. So there's sort of lessons in Japan's exception, or almost some policymakers had the idea that sort of Japan would mitigate against the charge of how it's behaving in other places, like in Central America, and that Japan was a model of what the U.S. wanted to claim it was, which was this benevolent global leader that can work with non-white states and provide opportunity for them in the free world. And they talk about this quite explicitly, for example, in the treaty that ends the occupation. So does that make sense? The, the exception is actually kind of part of the story. It becomes a showpiece. Yeah, it becomes a showpiece. Showcase, model, those are both words I use in the book. With regard to the National Police Reserve, um, how much did the Americans that were doing the training of the NPR in the early 1950s look at the other American examples in East Asia of training military, uh, of advising training militaries? South Korea would be the mm -hmm. obvious example. The Kuomintang in China before mm -hmm. the Chinese Revolution and then on Taiwan afterwards in the Philippines. Did they look at these as examples and how to work with Asians uh, as well or not? They looked at them as negative examples. So. Um, so for example, they I have some documents, I talk a little bit about this, that the, the argument they develop about why the nationalists, the GMD, the KMT, whatever transliteration you're using, lost um, the civil war in China is because they lost the confidence of the people. And so it like reinforces that idea of confidence and morale. They really look at Korea, actually, and especially because Korea is, gets first incorporated into American military training. You know, there's been the occupation, and then it's one of the first countries to get American military training assistance in 1949. And that doesn't go so well in uh, June and July of 1950, right? The North Korean military is able to very quickly push down to the bottom of the Korean Peninsula. And you see that very directly in discussions of the early NPR, where American occupation authorities are essentially saying, we do not want another Korea. This needs to be serious training. We need to find good officers and good leaders for this force because we don't want that to happen again. So they're very influenced by that. Now, in terms of Korea or China, Korea in particular, giving examples of how you sort of deal with people from East Asia, when they talk about that, they talk just in more broader stereotypes about how many American policymakers thought about East Asians at the time. So for example, one group of documents I found, and doing research on the NPR is kind of interesting in the American archives because the documents are very scattered among all these different collections. Um, they're not in one place. Um, so I found, I came upon this collection of documents that was reports by American military trainers that were stationed in NPR camps. So they were writing from each camp, writing a report about what they thought of the NPR. And this was as the occupation was about to end. So this was in late 51, early 52. And the US military knows it's kind of gearing up for a clash with the Japanese government about how many trainers are gonna remain in Japan and about how much oversight the U.S. is going to continue to get over the NPR once the occupation ends. And the U.S. wants more, and the Japanese want less. And so as part of preparing for this, they had all the trainers in all the different camps write these reports about where do you think the NPR stands. And this is where you see some of this thinking. 
So, for example, one thing the trainers talked about a lot was they said that communication was a huge problem. But when they talked about this communication problem, it wasn't that not a lot of the Americans spoke Japanese. It was that the Japanese had inferior communication styles and that Orientals cannot tell you what they really think because they'll lose face. So that was where you saw some of those ideas come up. Now, meanwhile, if you read Japanese oral histories about the NPR, they talk very derisively about American communication styles and how the American traders were heavy handed and didn't respect them and things like that. So Thanks. poor communication on all sides. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, first curious about the extent to which the purges happened of um, former officials, government officials, as, as well as military officers, what extent that was as part of the population, if you know that. But if, if not, that's also um, fine, because I'm, I'm also interested in if there was any uh, you know, dialogue between the simultaneous process of denazification mm. in Germany and the purges going on in political life at the same time in Japan, if policymakers were thinking about these uh, in tandem. Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by the purges, which the actual mechanics of them don't get a lot of attention in the English language literature. Um, there's sort of one book written explicitly on the purges that's from like 1965 or something like that. And other than that, they don't get a lot of um, they don't get a lot of treatment. So the purges were fairly extensive, um, especially of I mean, the military, there were sort of these blanket bans on categories. Right, anyone who's above this rank, anyone from military academies. So those in some ways were the simpler ones. Um, and then of course there was this process too of, I mean this was a massive effort to demobilize the entire Japanese military, bring everybody home, collect all the weaponry. This was all done by the Japanese government. It took a long time. The ones that where there was a lot more uh, questions were the purges of like political figures and what would be what's eligible to claim someone should be purged. And there would be a lot of back and forth about this because all of this was actually done by the Japanese. But the US could intervene at the last moment and say someone had to be purged or someone didn't have to be purged. And so on the one hand, it was this like very sort of mechanical process. There was like a form that people had to fill out. They had to say what they had done during the war, what their positions had been. And then it was decided from there if they would be purged. But at the same time, the American occupation authorities could intervene and say, no, you have to purge someone. The most infamous example was this one politician named Hatoyama Ichiro, who was about to become prime minister. And at the last minute, the occupation authorities was like, no, he's purged. Wow. Um, so it's, a, it's sort of a fascinating process. So have historians come up with any sort of estimate of how extensive? They have, but I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. It's in the hundreds of thousands, I believe. Okay. It's quite extensive. Um, and then in terms of denazification, I haven't seen any communication from the occupation authorities. I was looking at the occupation documents from government section in the occupation. It doesn't mean that there was, it wasn't there like in the State Department or something like that, but the occupations ran pretty, mu ran pretty much as its own thing in Japan, even though they're pursuing similar goals. Did they <coughs> mention denazification? Not that, I, not that I ever saw. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you've had a hand up over here. Similar question, not about the purges, but about sort of comparing and contrasting what was going on in the same time period in Japan versus the occupation in Germany. Mm -hmm. Did you look into that at all? Um, I read. A, I have read quite a bit about it. So if you have specific questions, I'm happy to. I was just curious to. about the, the similarities or uh, differences. I think so. There's a lot of similarities in terms of some of the foundational ideas of the occupation. This belief that American power is going to liberate the German people's natural desire for freedom that's going to be expressed through new political practices like elections and things of that <coughs> nature. One thing that's very different about the occupation of Germany is that Germany is divided. So the US has less direct freedom of action. And they actually learn from that very quickly because you know that structure is being set up in the summer of 1945. By the fall of 1945, they were like, there's no way we're dividing Japan. Japan is gonna be under our sole control. They consider for a while, for a little while, they're putting pressure on Chiang Kai-shek to maybe send some Chinese troops. 
to occupy Japan, but they even back off of that idea. And some British troops, British and Australian troops, do participate in the occupation in a very limited way. Um, Stalin tried to be a part of the occupation, and the US was like, ha, 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 no, that's not happening. Um, but I also think there are some larger ideas about what would threaten the creation of democracy in Germany that are operative at this same idea at the same time. And in Germany, you see this expressed, this idea of what I call sort of Cold War democracy. There are political theorists in Germany that call it militant democracy. And the German occupation also sort of has this turn in fearing that the openness of democracy is what threatens democracy. And thus, you have to pro preemptively mobilize against anti-democratic enemies. And in Germany, this idea actually has an even, in some ways, a longer fate than it does in Japan. Because in Japan, they talk about all of this, but they never actually do something like outlaw the Japanese Communist Party. In Germany, after the end of the occupation, the West German state will actually outlaw the Communist Party under this logic of militant democracy, which was an idea developed by a political theorist who had grown up in Germany, moved to the United States, and then moved back to Germany to participate in the occupation. So there are actually some quite similar ideas, but there's also some big differences. I think another one of the biggest differences is that the occupation in Japan is run through the Japanese <laughs> government, whereas the occupation in Germany is done directly. And that's in part because there is so little Japan expertise in the American government at this time period. Almost everyone who's an expert on Japan was part of the small group of planners that worked for the State Department during the war, and some of them then went into the occupation. Most of them have this expertise either through missionary experience, many of them are missionary kids, or diplomatic service. Those are the two areas of Japan expertise. And the US felt it just did not have the logistic or the language skills or anything like that to rule Japan directly. And so that means that in Japan, the occupation is done in this very interesting way. So what happens is the occupation authorities issue these orders. It's the responsibility of the Japanese government to then sort of turn these orders into legislation that is passed by the diet. So the occupation authorities issue the purge categories, but it's the Japanese government that actually carries them out. But then if the occupation authorities aren't happy with the legislation or the purge categories, they come back and intervene again. So it's, there's a lot of fluidity in the face of also very clear power hierarchies that are at work. How did the uh, occupation authority ensure that uh, you know, officers returning to the NPR uh, I guess it inculcated, uh, you know, American visions of, of democracy. That is an excellent question. Um, some of this was that they screened who was allowed to come back in. So not anybody was allowed to come back in. And so, for example, there was this one um, officer, uh, Imperial Army officer, who's uh, Hattori, who many believed was trying to get back into the NPR and use it as a base to rebuild a militarist military, mili like a militarist Japan. And he even had his alliances within the occupation authorities. Because within the occupation, right, we talk about the occupation authorities, but there's a lot of people in the occupation authorities. There's everyone from like committed New Dealers to people who admire General Franco and believe that like he was the model for what we should be going for here. Um, that's uh, Charles Willoughby. And he was actually close. He had these like former members of the Japanese Imperial Army that he worked with and was hoping to get into the NPR. Part of it was they screened it very closely. Part of it was that one another element of this was that they thought a lot about how officer education was going to take place and built things like new military academies, essentially, to think about how you can sort of train these officers in the democratic spirit. Um, they definitely, another thing that they did is that um, in the 50s, as Japan got incorporated into US military assistance programming, Japan was one of the biggest receivers of American military assistance funding. And one component of this is they would bring members of the NPR, especially officers, to the United States for a month or two to visit American bases and train with the United States. And they put a lot of um, emphasis on officers who had had experience in the Japanese military, in particular, 
were sort of a high part of those that were brought to the U.S. So I looked at these like rosters of who had come to the United States in the 1950s under American military assistance programs. And a lot of these were people that had Imperial Army experience. So they did things like that to try to ensure that they sort of had the democratic spirit. And as one um, Japanese officer wrote in a document, not bring any of the evil flavor of old militarism into the NPR. OK, I have time for one more question. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I, I just want to thank you. It's a really good uh, talk. I'm looking forward to looking at your book. I, I looked at this kind of this issue a couple years ago in more called in Japan. Um, John Dower said when we were getting ready to invade Iraq that we shouldn't look at the Japan mm -hmm. occupation, occupation the model for Iraq. He wrote a New York Times editorial about it. Yep. And uh, I think he was wrong on, uh, right in, in a lot of fundamental ways, but wrong on a lot of ways. And, and where I took it was that, um, you know, the state, the way we, it took us a, like four years in World War II to figure out how to do it. And we got the State War Navy Coordinating Committee going. Uh, and unified command by a senior seasoned <coughs> statesman general with the whole government in Japan in combination with that swing really uh, seemed to work pretty well. And we, I think we lost that in transition to the DOD and NSC system. But I think uh, looking at the, Ger that's where the German kind of Japan occupation coordination pot potential might have been. Uh, but then in Germany had four. Yeah. different yeah. occupiers and all sorts of other factors. But did, did you look at the economic aspects when you're looking at the, it, the, the kind of counter-democratization aspects? I think the psychological aspect is key, but I would say it's debatable how much the NPR and the JSCF have influenced Japanese concepts mm -hmm. of patriotism and, and so, so forth. But, um, you know, helping Japan build a resilient, capitalistic, democratic uh, you know, economy, economy, political system, I think was a, a major factor mm -hmm. in, in the defense against the communist influence. So I'll say a few things. First, I want to just call attention to something you said, which is the wartime planning process, which is, I think, a very underappreciated and understudied aspect of the occupation of Japan. There was four years of wartime planning for this that are fascinating documents because it's all, it's the main people who have expertise on Japan in the United States at this time period sitting down and debating all these aspects of Japanese society. And there's not, uh, a woman named Dana Barnes has just written a book about it called, I believe, Architects of Occupation. But those documents are not used very much and they are fascinating reading. And I think that is another, we were talking about differences between Japan versus the more recent democratization efforts of the United States. And I think that's another one. There was a very, very extensive planning process behind this occupation. MacArthur didn't just sort of descend from on high and decide what he was going to do, um, which is how he's often treated. But in fact, these documents went through wartime planning, then through SWINC, then through JCS, to the point where the occupation authorities landed with this long JCS document that laid out what they were going to do and apparently actually like cut it up and like, OK, your section is responsible for this. Your section is responsible for this. You're responsible for this part of the document. So I think it's really important to call attention to that. Now, in terms of this question about building kind of a healthy, capitalistic, democratic economy, I think that's really key. Um, and I think that actually, when people tend to talk about this policy turn in the late part of the occupation, that's one of the things they talk about, this turn towards rebuilding the Japanese military or the Japanese economy. But I think it actually fits into this framework because U.S. policymakers, when they're thinking about this, are saying things like, and this is a direct quote, a sane democracy cannot rest on an empty stomach. That you cannot have democracy endure if people are hungry and in deprivation and in want. And I think some of that comes from the experience of the Great Depression. It's interesting that many of these ideas, I talked about the late 40s and early 50s, but what I trace in the book is how many of these ideas by the later 1950s get pushed into the area of economic growth and are expressed through things like American productivity programming, which is this effort that sends advisors to work with Japanese companies and brings Japanese companies to tour the United States. And what they talk about now is how economic growth and what they call a productivity consciousness, 
not a democratic spirit, but a productivity consciousness is what's going to lead to the stability that's necessary for democracy. So I don't see it as an either or, but rather that it sort of is another component of the framework. I talked about one aspect of it, which is military power, but economic growth was actually another really crucial aspect of it. Well, I hate to cut off uh, what's a really good question and answer period, but uh, we've come to the end of the hour, so please join me in thanking Professor Miller.